right, well, welcome back to the Open Bible, Open Life Podcast. I'm Kyle Mercer, and you'll notice we're in our brand new podcast room with our first guest in this new podcast room, the Dr. Albert Moeller. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here with you, Kyle. Thank you. So you are Dr. Albert Moeller. Is it also Junior? Uh, it's my dad was the original Richard Albert Moeller. Okay. So he was senior. Okay. A name for him. But they decided I would go by the middle name. Oh. So, yeah, it's Richard Albert Moeller Jr. So I only use the junior when I use the R. Albert Moeller. Okay, I was going to say, because yeah. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen it on books before, maybe yeah. articles. Okay. Yeah. I, in fact, I want to hear about your family. One of the things I've noticed, I've been yeah. listening. I've told you this. I'm a long-time mm-hmm. listener to the briefing, right. as well as just some of your other teaching and preaching opportunities. And you can't help, in a good way, but yeah. to talk about your mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, and I know they're yeah. passing on there with the Lord now. But tell us about tell us about the upbringing you had in yeah. Lakeland, Florida. Lakeland, Florida. And uh, went to high school in Broward County, Pompano okay. Beach, down to the south. Yeah, I was born as the firstborn child to two... Um, just wonderful Christian parents, and uh, they loved each other, and they loved us, and uh, very much um, um, paycheck by paycheck. Okay. My you said dad, your dad worked for— My dad, when I was born, my dad was working as a salesman for Sherwin-Williams Paint. Wow. And uh, then he, he went into the grocery uh, chain, Publix, and yeah. uh, worked there for, all, all the way up to store manager where he served for many years. So he was with the company like 45 years, something like that. Wow. And uh, so he was just a hardworking Christian dad, hi- highly involved in church. Mm. Both my mom and my dad were just really, really involved in church, and that meant I was. And like I say, I grew up in a time when, for Southern Baptist kid, church was a full body experience. I mean, it was it was more hours a week than I can. I mean, how many guess. how many days a week are you were you in church as a kid? I mean, there's well, Sunday and there's Wednesday. It was, yeah. it, was, it was Sunday school, big church, yeah. you know, and then it was training union. <laughs> And uh, then you had fellowship after that and evening worship. So, uh, you know, that that's like six hours right there. Yeah. I was also in the youth choir, so that's the seventh hour. Okay. And, I mean, this was back when this is the doctrine of election understood, right? <laughs> yes. So I announced it when I was like 14, 15 years old. I announced it at the Sunday dinner table that I was dropping out of the youth choir. And my dad somebody looks at me and says, son, you never joined. <laughs> yeah. You know, you so try, yeah. I, you, I was there by divine election. Uh, it, was, it was. I never joined it. Um, but then, you know, here, here's the funny thing. This is how establishment the SBC church was at the time. The, uh, I mean, an SBC church yes. in the community. Um, we had royal ambassadors. Yes. And the church sponsored a Boy Scout troop. And it was the same boys with the same leaders on two different nights. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Just wearing different uniforms, you know? Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. And, and it, so there's something very good about that. Yes. And then, you know, youth group, all the rest— so uh, my my parents were deeply devoted to Christ and uh, raised us in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and and had it to the church every time the door was open, and that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And so when did you become a Christian? I became a Christian when I was nine years old. And, you know, I'd been surrounded by the gospel and surrounded by the things of God. And I'm very thankful for that. But it was when and, – and look, this is also something about the Deep South, okay, yes. or the, the, to be gr- raised in the South – in the time that I was, in like the 1960s, I didn't go to vacation Bible school. I went to vacation Bible schools. How many? Many. Like four. Yeah. Well, yeah. I see a lot of parents even today, they mm-hmm. realize there's free child care in the summer if they drop their kids off. It was off sort of that. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. sort of that. You know, yeah, yeah keep them busy. And, uh, but I loved it, you know, and so just made the same Bible maps of the Holy Land with food coloring and, you know, four <laughs> different churches. I actually went to a Methodist church every year because my grandmother was Methodist. Yes. And I go to their vacation Bible school, and it was just like the same stuff, just different Bible stories. You yes. Know? And uh, so I was sitting as a nine-year-old in a vacation Bible school at a very small church, which had a bivocational pastor. I didn't know any of these words. Yeah. Yeah, he was a phosphate miner. And uh, he was also a pastor. He came in and preached— on uh, the final assembly on Friday morning. And I had this crushing realization that I was a sinner. Wow. And I had never never really I'd not experienced anything like that. And uh, so it 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 was, you know, the Lord showing me my sin. And and look, the the pastor was preaching. He was saying it's not just that you sin, it's that you are a sinner. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think I'd ever thought about that before. Yeah. So I felt as much as a nine-year-old can feel this crushing weight of sin. And then he preached Christ. And it just, 
it was it's just like Luther, you know, talking about the Gospels as if the windows of heaven opened. Wow. Um, and so I told my mom and dad, and they were very affirming. But they also wanted to test these things. And yeah, you're so, nine. You know, I met with the pastor. I do believe the Lord uh, called me unto Himself in, in terms of my temporal uh, lifeline uh, when I was nine. And I always had to grow out in grace, but yeah. I, I I I don't think. Uh, that was an early experience, and then I got converted later. I think that was my conversion. Yeah. Well, last night, one of the things I appreciate about Ask Anything, I know how much you love taking questions from listeners of the briefing that are younger. You'll say often, Absolutely. hey, this is an eight-year-old or you know, right, ten. Right. And one of the questions last night that all of our listeners didn't get to hear is a young man, one of the first questions, I say young man, probably a 10, 12-year-old boy, said, Dr. Moeller, how were you called to ministry? And yeah. you told a just real sweet story that I'd love to get a short version of again. Just, yeah. just, just how God used the desire to teach and the opportunity from your dad. <laughs> Tell yeah, that story. It wasn't real an quick. opportunity. Oh, more of a command. You of were election. voluntold. Yeah, yeah. No, my dad walked in. I was sixteen, and my dad. I guess he was just a layman. He's he's he's, he's working hard. He's superintendent of the Sunday school, and he came in and he said, uh, "I'm a teacher short," and I thought, you know, that that must be a challenge. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, my dad and I were very close, yeah. but I, I didn't catch on immediately. And he said, yeah, it's uh, first graders. And uh, he said, I have a, a woman uh, uh, to teach the girls. I don't have a man to teach uh, the boys. And he said, uh, um, he looked at me and, and more or less said, you're going to do it. And I said, Dad, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not a Bible teacher. And he said, well, you're not now, but you will be tomorrow. <laughs> By the time you go to – yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, that, that was really that experience. You know, you're a 16-year-old kid. You're a boy. Yeah. And there are no six-year-old boys. Yeah. But, you know, there is no age in which a 16-year-old has more influence than Isn't that on a truth? six-year-old boy. Yes. You know, it's just massive. So I told them to sit down. They sat down. Yeah, you know, and I I I, I taught him the, the 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 Bible story, and you know I discovered there's a connection here. Yes, there's, there's something unbelievable about reading the Bible and then trying to explain it to people and seeing lies lock uh, the the eyes lock on. Yes, yes, and so I, I pretty much I think the Lord used that to call me. Uh, into the teaching ministry, into the yeah. preaching ministry. I can trace it all back, I think, to that night. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, you said something as well uh, last mm -hmm. night that I thought was interesting. Just so simple, but you said, you said I love to teach. Right. And you said, and I realize people love to be taught. And isn't oh, yeah. that the truth? Oh, because yeah. I love to be taught. Right. I think that's why you're seeing the— Absolutely. Whether it's the podcast or the, the yeah. YouTube, or, yeah. or people are just designed to learn. Okay, so right. let's talk about—there's so many areas I want to get uh -huh. to, but I want to talk about you are—you're going to have to fill in the gray uh -oh. areas here. Okay, so you are— in your early 30s, yep. so this is 30-plus years ago, and you're at Southern Seminary, and you are a Ph.D. student there. Okay, so okay. there you go back 40 years. Okay, 40, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So you're done with your Ph.D. Yeah. How does it? How do you end up being one of the guys that is selected to potentially be the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary? Like, how does that, how does that happen to a guy in his early 30s? Well, I guess, Kyle, one thing I want to say is at least a part of this was a very thin bench. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Yeah. Okay, so Adrian Rogers, uh, the pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church, first conservative president of the SBC in the conservative research, titanic figure. Yes. You know. J would you even say anyone today could compare to him? No. 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 Just and, in, in the same way, no one can compare to Billy Graham. Yeah. No he one just, can compare was a man to Martin first Luther. He, yeah. God made him at a time. It that, that that That's when he, you know, walked upon the earth and, and did change history. Yeah. So uh, Adrian used to say that the conservative movement in the SBC was like a dog that's been chasing a garbage truck for 20 years. Okay. So one day he catches it. Now what does he do with it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. He's just a dog with a gar garbage truck. And the problem, one problem for the conservative resurgence in the SBC is that they had an awful lot of foot soldiers. They didn't have that many officers. Yes. And when it came to someone who could be president of a seminary, who actually knew what theological education was, had a you know a respected doctoral degree, um, could uh, could have the respect of the academic community, and would serve with some real administrative savvy. I mean, there just weren't that many people. Yeah. And the convictions were the big thing. You know, the the moderate movement in the SBC had been fantastic at producing those people. Yeah. But they were not conservatives. That's right. And so the big problem was convictional. So to make a long story short. Uh, they turned to me as someone with the right convictions that they believe had the experience and the the vision to pull this off. Now, I still think the longer I live, the more weird I think that decision to have been on the part of that search committee. You look back on 33-year-old you and, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm mean, actually going to look, look at video of the 33 year old me, and I was thinking, man, that's that's horrible. <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, I mean it's just you. You look at this. There's there's a reason why there aren't that many. You know, you, you don't have 33 year olds planning D Day. No. You know, you don't have 33 year old presidents of the United States. You Actually, don't. Two two years too young constitutionally. Yes, that's right. You know? Yeah. And, and so you look at this and you go, well, yeah, it, I could say in retrospect, this had to be God's doing. Yes. Um, but the search committee was unanimous. Yeah. So they, they, they were so unanimous they a month in. before they even intended to make a decision. The board was overwhelming. And so all I can say was the word was in it, and evidently it made sense to enough people that they yes. acted very quickly to make it happen. Okay, so but you are a student, but then you become the president. Do you do anything in between? Or I you... was editor of the Christian Index for four years, okay. which was the, the Southern Baptist uh, State newspaper in Georgia, okay. which was an absolutely crucial role. There's no internet. So okay. I go. was really the opinion shaper for you know a, a huge constituency. Okay, so they bring and, you in, and I've heard you mm-hmm. tell this story, and why yeah. I wanted to get it on podcast is, and it, I heard it years ago, so so correct me when I'm wrong on this if I am wrong, but there was a moment where you said they brought you in to speak, this the board, right. uh, and they said, give us your vision right. of Southern Seminary. Right. And if I remember you correctly, you said, I spoke for six hours. It, it was maybe actually a little longer. I mean, come on. Yeah. So how did you get a vision like that? I mean, that's... I mean, the Lord had put it on my heart over years. So are you, and, and you're so in Georgia I, and you're, are you, well, are you thinking... Well, remember, I'd been at Southern Seminary. I'd been an MDiv student. I'd been a PhD student. Yes. I was deep into the life of the institution. I became assistant to the president. And were you at yeah. the time, you're, you're like, I, there's some problems here. And Oh, I, absolutely. I wasn't sure at the time how to solve them. By the time that position was looking for a, a, a new president, I thought I'd come to the conclusion about how to solve them. Yeah. I thought I'd come to the conclusion about how to fix the problem. So I thought that's what the search committee wanted to talk about. I thought they wanted to talk about that and about conviction. Yeah. So they asked us to write a response to the, the finalists. There were, there were really three of us. They asked us to write a response to the abstract of principles, which is our confession of faith. All right. So I thought they meant it. <laughs> so I produced like a 60-page professionally published response. Uh, by the way, um, one of my faculty members currently asked to see a copy of it, and I hadn't seen it in like 30-some years. And so I did have a copy and found it and gave it to him, and I read it myself, partly to see, do I still agree with myself 30 years later? <laughs> and I'm thankful to say, absolutely so. But the point is, I took that very seriously. And then when, when we – I was the last of the candidates to be interviewed. Hmm. The interview was undertaken on Singer Island in Florida. The politics were so hot that um, it was impossible for the search committee to meet in any known place. Wow. Because the press just lined up outside the door and TV cameras and all the rest. It was that hot. And so we're, we're down on this island, which is uh, off of the east coast of Florida. It was, it was a very nice place, but that really didn't matter. Uh, they asked me in on um, – it was Thursday uh, – excuse me, Wednesday morning. So it was, I was the third person. I had an interview with someone else Monday, interview with the second candidate Tuesday. I was Wednesday. And uh, they asked the first question like, what do you think Southern Seminary could be? And what would it take to get there? Well, I just thought what they want me to do is jump in the deep end of the pool. So I jumped into the deep end of the pool, and I said, here's where it is. And I I think basically it was like six and a half to seven hours answering that question. And at the end of it, I, t- I told Mary before we, we had a formal dinner with them that night, very, very formal affair. And I said, you know— because she's she's with me. She's thirty one. I mean, we're just we're so young. And she said, "How do you think it went?" And I said, "I don't. I just don't think they're going to ask someone my age to be president. But at least I've given them a plan." Yeah. You know. So we had dinner. It was very nice, very cordial, but of course noncommittal. And then uh, we were down in Florida, and both of our sets of parents were in Florida, and we had two babies at the time. You know, they were three and one, I guess. So. We uh, decided to go down and spend time with both sets of grandparents. Then we're going to fly back Sunday. So on a Thursday afternoon, I get a call from one of the members of the search committee, and they said, look, um, we've, we've had some 
Well, obviously, there was a lot of press coverage. There was there was a lot of speculation running around, and they said, "Do we? We've, we've had some issues. We, we'd like to discuss with you. We'd like to follow up on a couple of questions, and so we, we'd like to interview again on Friday. You, and would you please bring Mary? And, and look, poor Mary didn't even have a second dress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we were going down there to play with it. grandkids. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, our kids with their, their grandparents, and this interview. Inter- so I I had my suit, and uh, she had. A very nice dress. She didn't have a second one. Thankfully, she and my mom had the same size and the same taste. Yeah. Um, and uh, so she got a dress. We didn't know what in the world could be going on here. It was nerve wracking. It was like an hour and a half drive to get up there. We walked in. I did not catch on as fast as Mary did, because I was really, I was really in, engrossed in trying to figure out what was going on out there. Um, Back then, there were message boards. There was no email. Yeah, there were message boards, and uh, the press used to use those a lot. And, you know, just kind of like what a, on a PC, you could just see someone post a sentence, and that was that kind of was the news medium at the time that was fastest. And there was just all kinds of stuff on there. So I didn't know what it was going to be. Mary caught on before I did, and uh, she puts her hand on my leg. Uh, in a sweet way. And, yeah. and so the, the trustee chairman says, we have basically one question to ask of you. We need the answer clarified. So I'm thinking, what in the world is this? And he said, we would like to nominate you to be the next president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. We'd like you to answer if you would accept. Whoa. Yeah. So I didn't see that. Coming. This happened really quickly. So this happens over just, the, you, they you were speak they one were day. Su- and they then... were supposed to pray for a month and then make a decision. So that was very fast. I, I can see in retrospect how the Lord moved things together. All the pieces make sense coming together only in retrospect. And how many people were on this board that brought you in? Uh, well, the Roughly. board had 63 members, but there was an eight-member search committee. Okay. Yeah. The search committee was eight members. Okay. So it was eight members, yeah. <clears throat> so you you obviously accept. Uh, yes. And then you move there under – there's so much hostility on this campus. I mean, uh, just to tell one story that I've heard, yeah. you go to preach your first chapel message, don't just do something, stand there. Kind of against the yeah. liberal progressive mindset, yeah. and if I remember this story correctly, there's something hanging in a tree. Yeah, that that came in August. We moved there Memorial Day. Okay, so of ninety three of ninety three. So unfortunately, we got two months before I'm president. That's a very awkward, awkward, awkward period. So you don't have any power or authority. You're kind of just you're moving in. No, it's 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 sort of like you know the invading force. You know, just kind of hovering off the – out in the English Channel, you know. <laughs> and so uh, the hostility was massive. And, you know, this was one of the things I say. There, there there were many people who were opposed to us but were not mean. Yes. But there were a lot of mean people. Oh, I bet. And, you know, when they'll be mean to babies, that's really mean. Yeah. And so your so, family was attacked, not just you. Oh, definitely. Mary – I mean, Mary – so gracious. She put up with so much. But we had a four-year-old and a one-year-old at that time. And it was just very difficult, you know. Four-year-old and one-year-old, how can you dislike them? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yes. And be mean to them or yeah. disrespectful. And many people weren't. I want to be clear. But there was a meanness and an, an anger that just boiled over. And then what you're talking about is my opening convocation. That's what I'm talking yeah. about, yes. And so that's the first time I get up in public as president. Yes. It's a, it's a command performance every time we begin a term. So I've now done it many, many times. But I knew this was D-Day. To take my English channel yeah, analogy further, it was D-Day. So I better lay on the line w- what's at stake. Yeah. So I simply preached a message entitled, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. Yes. Which is the inversion of that statement. It was actually trackable to William F. Buckley Jr. And uh, so I borrowed the title, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. And I talked about the nature of Southern Seminary as a confessional institution. Yes. We have a confession of faith. It's not just there as a symbol it is what every faculty member signs and agrees to teach in accordance with and not contrary to all that is contained therein without yes. hesitation or mental reservation, without private arrangement with the one who invests him in office. All right. So Southern Seminary's contract is that clear. And I said, so every one of you has said that you teach in accordance with and not contrary to everything in this confession of faith. If you do, you may stay. If you don't, you must go. And... That meant that like 99% of them had to go. Including the professors you learned under. Including the professors I mean, that, I I'm just trying under. to imagine yeah. what that had to be like. 
Because it doesn't the story. It was, a, it was a pretty horrible feeling. So is, but, isn't this what happens? Again, I'm trying to remember because yeah. I, I heard you tell this story 10, 15 years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, you end up going, so you preach this message. Right. You're like, uh, you right. Know, it didn't go over great. You know, people tur- p- people standing, well, turning and, and around. What you were talking about, going in, marching in, it's a formal procession yes. in. Um, I saw something hanging from a tree, and I asked David Dockery, who was the provost with me yeah. at the time, I said, what is that? He said, I think that's you. I was hung in effigy. Unbelievable. Yeah, on a tree. And then when you preach, half the faculty, half the students turn their back while you're preaching. One faculty member, memorably, but okay. lots of students well, turn and I, their and back. And I know what it's like to yeah. preach. We all be yeah. with this. What it's yeah. like to preach and feel like, okay, there yeah. might be one person out here who doesn't like right, what I'm saying. Right, right. Yet alone to have half the students turn their back. Okay, right. so then— the, that, ma- the majority of the faculty expressed their displeasure the moment I began. Yes, but it was a bunch of students in particular who stood up and turned their backs. Unbelievable yeah. in protest. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, what do you do in that kind of situation? I didn't premeditate a response because I had no idea this was going to happen. Yeah. So what it did was, however, it steeled my resolve. So I thought, okay, I'll now preach lo- louder. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so you end up preaching this message, and it's either this day or soon after, you go back to your office and you tell your assistant. It's the same day. Okay, and you say they're coming, yeah. basically. Yeah, so and, 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 at, at that time, there was a formal faculty committee, at capital F, capital C. That's what it was known as, the okay. faculty committee. It's the senior faculty. Okay. And boy, they got massive authority. They basically can come close to vetoing what a president does. Wow. Now, that's not true anymore. We, we solved the structure problem, but yeah. it was true then. Okay. Okay. And uh, I, I told my executive assistant, I said, yeah, they, they, they'll be here by the afternoon. And, and I mean, because you, you can write this script. Yeah. So right after the opening convocation, when I said, if you agree with this, you can stay. If you, if you don't, you must go. Remember, they got tenure. They got contracts. You know, it's the whole shebang. I knew exactly what I was doing. I told the, the trustees, here's how we deal with this. Yes. We hold the heresy trial. Yeah. Yeah. There you That's go. what we do. And yeah. I, I made the prediction. I said, if we have to hold one, we won't have to hold a second. Because I mean, Southern Baptists are going to hear this; they're going to side with the truth. They are, you know. This is so it, you know, we can, sort of like you know the old adage: we can do it the easy way or the hard way. Yeah. Well, they all end up choosing the easy way. Yeah. But it was it was a close call in many of those cases. Came down to the final wire. But the uh, faculty committee came to see me that afternoon, and uh, it was one of those surreal experiences because th- that's when I never felt more thirty three than at that moment. I believe it. And some of these were my own professors, and some of them I'd known since I was a boy. And here's the problem, Kyle. I mean, I loved some of them. Yeah. But I could not love them teaching at an institution where they were violating the confession of faith. Yes. Okay, so, but I did love them. And so this is very hard. I revered them, you know, as being a student. And so they had a spokesman. They all came in my office. Everybody sitting down. How many? Down. A handful? I think there was a seven, seven okay. members of the, the faculty committee. And this is a fairly small office at the time. And they all sit, and there was a spokesperson, and he's someone I'd known probably longer than anyone else in that room. And he simply turned to me and he said, Mr. President, we are here on behalf of the faculty. Well, okay. Uh, as the faculty committee, we just want to respond officially to your assault upon this institution this morning. Mm. And I said, uh, Define assault upon this institution. And they said, your convocation address. And I thought, you know, I was actually paid to do that, if you want the really bad news. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is words, why I was hired. This is why I was hired. That, yeah. that, that, that's what I did. And, and I said, and here's the thing. I hope every Southern Baptist can hear what I said. Yes. Because I want to tell you, they'll side with me. And they yes. will also say that should never have had to be said. You know. So anyway, I, I, so one of these guys was really into postmodern philosophy and, and epistemology at the time. And he says, Dr. Mueller, Mr. Pre-, you know, it was always Mr. President, very efficient. Mr. President, you know full well, and I did because I was one of his students. He said, you know that uh, the hermeneutical equation has been resorted, that, the, that uh, the, the author is dead. We all get to uh, interpret the text according to our own experience. Uh, no one has the right to oppress by determining a hegemonistic singular meaning of a text and all this. And he simply said after about, I don't know, it seemed like 30 minutes, probably more like a a five to seven minute diatribe. 
with great satisfaction, he leans back in his chair and says, how are you going to respond to this? Okay, I didn't see that coming the way it came. And look, I don't want to sound like Rambo at all because I didn't feel that way, Kyle. I felt yeah. like a little tiny body yeah. in the midst of people you revered. Like people you said, I yeah. revered and yeah. loved. And I simply looked at her and I said, you're all fired. Unbelievable. Okay, now these I mean, are that, senior, that's where the music, these are if this is a Netflix faculty. show, that's where the music yeah. changes. I mean, yeah. there it is. Well, the music changed because I think, you know, okay, this, <laughs> this may be, I mean, this may be the shortest presidency in the history of theological education. <laughs> and, and I knew exactly what was coming after that. And uh, because remember, it's all about the indeterminacy of the text. The text doesn't mean anything. You decide what it means. Every is that Derrida? Well, it's Derrida. It's uh, it's it's Lyotor. It's 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 the whole yeah uh, yeah yeah the whole the whole postmodern stuff, you know. And uh, so this professor said exactly as he should have said. He said, "You can't get away with that." And I said, "Why not?" And he said, "Because we have contracts." And I simply said, and I, I, will, I will just tell you, it's one of the moments in which I realized I just grew up like 20 years in that moment. Hmm. And I just said, well, that only works if you don't read your contract the way you want to read the confession of faith. Because hmm. you just said the author is dead. The text has indeterminate meaning. So if that's true, it's true for your contract. Yeah. Let me interpret your contract. And they, they said... <laughs> You will not win on that in court. I said, of course I won't, because no court's going to take your argument seriously. But I said, Southern Baptists are going to take this argument very seriously. That's right. And more or less, this can, this can happen the easy way or the hard way, but it's going to happen. Okay. So at that point, I closed the door. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's like all the energy just drained out of my body. Yeah. And I have this sweet wife at home who's praying for me, has no idea how this is turning out. There are no cell phones. Yeah. I can't text her. So I just left and went over. And uh, saw her at the house across the street. And I simply said, sweetie, you know, the, the battle is joined. We'll find out. Yeah. And the trustees sustained me massively. And, uh, and the rest was history. It did yeah. take about three more years, a little bit more than that, to move everybody out. And then the problem was we had an empty house. We had to fill back in. Yes. You had to find faculty. So you had to get rid yeah. of all the, the liberal faculty. Right. The liberal, and then you right. had to go find from all over the right. United States the best. Right. Baptist and the Lord allowed us to yeah. do just that. Yeah, I mean, we got to hire the faculty I'd want to study with. How did how did the we, we can move on from other things? But my last question is: How did the role of Southern Seminary in its transformation back its conservative resurgence? How is that connected to the what was happening in general at the SBC at the time? Were you guys on the front end of this in the middle of no, it? No, we're the back of it. Okay, the back of it. Yeah, uh, there were a couple of institutions in the SBC uh, entities that were slower than everyone else, and it's because. Um, the size of our boards and the length of the term. Interesting. So Southern had, Southern had a self-perpetuating board until the 1970s. Okay. Okay. And so then the SBC really took over electing trustees. But uh, the, there were five-year terms, and there was no limit to two terms at one point. Okay. So we had people that served on the board, you know, for 20 years. And so those seats didn't turn over very fast. It took a long time. So what happened to Southern, by the way, is that uh, due to some providential circumstances, the conservatives on the board went from being a minority to being a bylaw-changing majority in one meeting. Wow. Yeah, so that's why and things that happen so fast. that's what leads to you coming. That's what leads to me coming, yeah. And is, is Southern the first of the SBCs to turn? No. It's the last. It was the last. So, yeah. so Southeastern even turned before this. Oh, absolutely. Paige I, Patterson was president of Southeastern long before Southern was looking for a president. Okay. I didn't know I didn't yeah. know the organization. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk so, about Southern because of the trustee setup. Yes. It was the it took it took longer for conservatives to gain control there. But once you gain control, one of the things is this unique to Southern is the power of the office of the president. The power of the office of the president at Southern Seminary is incredible. And it's historic. Yes. And it goes back, by the way, to the time when trustees had to elect a president and then, you know, get on a horse and ride somewhere. So, and, and, you know. <laughs> I got to trust this guy to get things done. Right. So you have to empower a president. Southern's a little bit unique in that I am, in a very real legal sense, not an employee of the seminary at all. How does that work? I'm the sole employee of the board of trustees. Okay. It's an old corporate model that's, uh, where I'm the agent of the board. 
Makes sense. So and that that's where the term chief executive officer really comes from. Really? It, it comes from the fact that you know, the board hires an executive officer and then goes home. Yeah. And so I my existence is mechanically to enforce the will of the board. Okay. Yeah. And the, but it, there's much more to that in terms of leading the institution and building the institution. Yes. But constitutionally, the most important thing I do is execute, as in the executive office, um, what is uh, approved by the board. Makes sense. Now, we talked a lot about – we call that your day job. I know it's much more than your day job of saying be the president. Mm-hmm. But you also do so many other things. That's why I say right. that. Um, they do, all grow out of that, that singular that, purpose Yes, to, uh, to help build the Southern Baptist Convention, um, healthy evangelical Christianity. Yes. The defense of Christianity in a secularizing age. Yes. And so it's, it's all tied together. But, yes, it's, it's much more than the average seminary president. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of things, of course, yes. writing books. And let's stop right. there for a second. My favorite book, I have not yeah. read all of your books. My favorite book that you've written uh-huh. is The Conviction of Lead. Thank you. I just yeah. love that. Tell me tell me about how that book came came to be. I didn't want to write a book on leadership. There's so many books on leadership out there. And I thought the last thing, you know, the Christian church needs is one more book on leadership. So I had a publisher come to me and say, uh, we'd like you to write a book on leadership. And And my first thought was, well, you know, they want somebody with a name to write something because it'll Hasn't John copies. Maxwell written enough things? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. However, I was a critic of much of that literature. Yeah. And and part of the why why I criticized it is because it's not that there's nothing to learn from those guys. It's that you don't have to be Christian at all to apply all of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's distinctively Christian to me about leadership is that it's convictional leadership. It, it's, it, it's what grows out of the convictions. Yes. Uh, the convictions are not ornamentation. Uh, they're the passion. And so I was shocked. Publishers, and more than one talked to me about it, publishers were fascinated by this and said, I wish you'd just run with that. Yeah. So at that point, I thought, well, you know, I guess I've got to. Yeah. So I did. I wrote a manuscript. It, that entire manuscript was trashed. Um, okay. Because you ended up, what, a, going 25 principles? What is it? 25 20, 25 principles in, in, yeah. in the uh, second edition. We added a couple. Yeah. Uh, that's the nice thing about a second edition. Yeah, yeah. here's three that I could have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, the world's changed, too. Yeah. You know. Uh, for one thing, I had a chapter on the leader in social media. Okay, that became a much darker world. That, that, that world's much more complicated morally yes. now than it was then. So I had to, had to rewrite that and do some other stuff as well. But I, uh, I I wrote the manuscript, and it was just not good. And it's not that I didn't believe what I had written. It just, it just wasn't going to be that helpful. And so I had somebody who read it and said, it's, it's just not that good. And uh, so I, d- I did trash that manuscript and wrote the whole thing over again. I wrote the whole thing over again kind of mad. You know what I mean? Because this <laughs> yeah. didn't work. Yeah, yeah. So I got to write this whole thing over again. It turned out to be very providential. Hmm. Because I wrote it again in one voice, just and, and smoothed everything out. Yes. And so once I had the outline, I got the very good advice from a dear friend who said, and he was actually quoting Tim LaHaye. Okay. Of all people. He said, Left of all series. people. He said, go. Tim LaHaye said, the key to writing is in imagining yourself sitting with your best friend and you're just explaining something to him. Hmm. And that's actually very helpful. I like it. That's very helpful. And so I just sat down and decided, okay, with that in mind, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do this. So I always have people in mind. I don't use photographs, but I've always got specific people in mind when I write books now. Yeah. And I've written many since then, writing some now. And so I actually have in my mind some specific faces looking at me as I write the book. Hmm. I want to make sure I'm writing so that he, she, those people understand what I'm doing and I think it's important. Yeah. My favorite line in that book is you talk about leadership is a competency that puts the room at ease. Right. I have used that yeah. so many times yeah. in, in, in trying to go, this is what I'm trying to be in this area. Or I can remember, right. you know, when my son, he's fine now, but when he was first born, he had a little jaundice yeah. and and I'm so nervous. And then, and a medical student comes in and you know, he doesn't know. And, and then a resident comes in and she doesn't know. Right. And then the head doctor comes in. Right. And as soon as he came in, there was just a calmness. Hey, this is yeah. what's going on. Let me explain it. And it's just like, right. ah, that's the leadership that puts, right. that's the competency that puts everybody right. else at ease. Yeah. You know, you see something healthy like this in a healthy home. Yeah. 
you know, where there's all of a sudden chaos and dad walks in and you know what? Chaos disappears. Yep. Uh, it's like, it's what happens when I say, you know, you're, you're, the Lord is using your leadership when you walk in a room and people start to head for a chair around the table. Yep. They know we're about to do something serious. Yes. You know, something good. Uh, <laughs> I love it. It's going to be important. I'm, I'm, let's just get ready for this. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the, the illustration of a doctor's is very good. And there, there are times in which, more times than maybe the leader perceives, in which just entering the room in the right way at the right time is actually, like, an incredible contribution. Amazing. Yeah. Let's talk about the briefing. Um, okay. You and I have talked about this just a little bit since you've been here. Yeah. I mean, the, the reach, I mean, I, I know you, first you had, you had a national radio show. You've had even more things, I'm sure, before that. I'm saying, but a national radio yeah. show, yeah. how does it, first, let's just talk, how do, how do you go from national radio show to podcast world briefing? Like, what's the story with that? Well, the radio came to me by invitation. Okay. And it was a national daily radio program, Drive Time. Okay. And I loved doing it, by the way. I really did enjoy doing it. And, you know, it was about um, 16 minutes in which I talked about the issues of the day from a Christian perspective, Christian worldview perspective. And then the rest of the time, it was about one issue, and we had a call-in segment. So we'd have people call in and all the rest. Well, that has to be live. Live means live. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that meant that five days a week, five o'clock Eastern time, I not only had to be close to a mic, I had to be behind one. And under very unusual, you know, acoustic and, and yeah, situation. And the, the, this, the digital age is very young, and a lot of it is still coaxial cable. I mean, that's just what it is. And so that became an enormous liability because I have to travel all over the world. Yeah, I get it. And so, I mean, somehow I'd have to land the plane, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. do a radio program. So, and, and there's very little ability even to say record one ahead of time because yeah. live is live. You know, if you're going to have yeah. call-ins, like, obviously they won't work. So podcasting emerged and it seemed to me to be very interesting, but no one is sure this is going to work. You have this enormous legacy media investment over here, you know. Clear Channel AM stations, lots of Christian FM stations and oh, all yeah. the rest. And that's prize real estate. Podcasting is going to democratize everything. But yeah. nobody knows how it's going to work. So I'll just say I just it just seemed right to me. And so we jumped into podcasting really early. Like what year, roughly? I would have to say 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're doing yeah. this 2009, you're starting the briefing. Right. Some, some version some, of it. Somewhere, somewhere around there, yeah. And the Lord just blessed, and and podcasting took off. Now, it didn't take off then the way it's taken off even more recently yeah, yeah. in a different format like we're doing even right now. But it, it did liberate me from the tyranny of having to be in a radio studio every day at five. Yes. It also expanded the potential impact of what I was doing because it wasn't – Available to people only, you know, Monday through Friday at 5 o'clock until 6 o'clock. I'm with you. It's now available 24-7 if people, you know, as soon as it's posted, you know, people over the world can have access to it. You know, the amazing thing about a podcast is is that someone in Bangladesh has exactly the same access as, you know, someone across the street from me. Yeah. I, I don't know if yeah. you've read this recently, but someone told yeah. me that now podcast is the number one type of media consumed by Americans. You, you know, is that I, true? I will just say – that kind of data, it's all how you frame the question. Yeah, okay. And so it's hard for me to go, well, there's so much Netflix, there's so much other things. But, yeah, but there's I, certainly I, a rise. I will simply of... say the impact of podcasting is so vast. I don't think it can be exaggerated, but I don't know how to rank it. With I mean, everything. even think about this. We just ended an election. Yeah. I mean, you think about, yeah. you, people could argue, but how important Joe Rogan and getting on Joe Rogan, both Trump and No, Jimmy absolutely. And, and and even others before that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the, the whole podcasting thing, now you add video and all the rest, even defining it is not that easy. Yes. I mean, most people, I, I was talking to a student the other day, and he just said, what does podcasting even mean? I said it was, it was played on an iPod, thus podcasting. And I realized he's never seen an iPod. Oh, yeah. Isn't, isn't that an interesting thought? Oh, it yeah, is, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the briefing. So now I want to hear just how you yeah. do a briefing episode. So, uh, so yeah, because here's what I think. I mean, I, I, I told our staff this. I told you this earlier, but if somebody said to me, yeah, you know, Kyle, you don't have to do anything else, and you could make a living just by doing uh-huh. a 25 minute briefing uh, every day, five days a week, right? And, but you don't have anything else to do. I don't know that I could do it. 
I don't think I could do it. In, in, in other words, the the amount of the amount of things you have to stay up on. Then you have to prioritize and triage it. Then you have to uh, record it, which I want to hear about. You know, then you, so you're recording it, and then you've got to get it. I know you have a team that helps you. You've right. got to get it out, and then it's like it's like preaching, but just five days a week. Now. Right. It's like right. a new episode drops. My I, work is all on the front end through the finishing of the recording. Yes. As soon as it's recorded, it's somebody else's. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I just want yeah. to say because I want to ask you more questions about it, uh-huh. but I, I can just think about how important these are. I can remember I was actually staying at a friend's huh. house. This is, I think it was December. I don't remember what year. And the Sandy Hook shootings oh, yeah, that just yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was horrible, as we all know. And within a couple hours, special edition of the briefing. You know, uh, you are, I mean, I know you try to take a break in July, but, right. uh, you know, it's like, okay. I, I remember it's like Trump gets shot. It's like, right. I'm like, there's no way Dr. Mueller is not addressing this. Uh, right. You know, Biden, uh, you know, there's a coup and Biden's out, and, you know, whatever. Right, and right. and you're, there you are again. And it's right, like you're, you're, right. you're updated and you're genuinely, you are, I'm sure you're helping the average Christian, but I, I know for sure you are mm. helping pastors and mm. leaders who were trying to go, how do we talk about the election? Yeah. How do we talk about abortion? What do we say about transgenderism? So one, I want to say thank you, but two, just talk mm. about, I mean, because because you come here uh, yesterday, I, I yep. met you for dinner, and... Um, First thing I see is about ten newspapers. <laughs> you, you, you're constantly. Yeah. You're, I mean, tell us about yeah. what this looks like. So that started very early for me, like when I was in high school. Just reading the news. I'm an omnivorous consumer of the news, and I want to understand it. I want to know what's going on. You know, Francis Schaeffer at Libri, yeah. a very famous Christian thinker, a massive impact on my life. I was never with him at Libri, but I knew what he did. And at Libri, he would take things like Newsweek, Time Magazine. He'd have a group of college students sitting on the floor. And they're just trying to understand the world. And he would talk about what Time Magazine was talking about, and then he would talk about it from a Christian perspective. Unbelievable. And this is a sexual revolution, you know, the divorce revolution, all this kind of stuff, just giant stuff. And he would take it right down to arts and all the rest, which is you know, just a, a great example in that sense. And I needed someone to do that. So I, I was reading all this, and I wanted someone to say, okay, here's how you, how you think through these things. I had some people who were guides of a sort, but nobody's doing this, certainly on a daily basis. And uh, so, I, I mean, this started out back when I was uh, at the index, as editor of the Christian Index. I used to have a fax list. And um, every couple of days, I would send out a fax. And I don't know if people... I was going to say, some of our no listeners are not going to It was basically a teletype machine that received digital transmissions, yeah. and, and you could print things out, you know, and, and they call, called it a fax, even on facsimile paper. The thing is, you could actually send a document, a photograph of a document, you know, from one place to another. And and it looked very crude and fuzzy, but nonetheless, there it was. So I started putting out what was called Fidelitas Facts. And and that was basically like the briefing, but it was in writing. So here'd be a news source. And then eventually you were able to do hyperlinks. How's that? You know, you can actually put a link on the World Wide Web, you know. So then you can say not only does this article exist, but here's where you can see it. And... uh, so I started out doing that. That then led to the radio program and, and then to the podcasting. But I do start out every day with a massive amount of newsprint. Yeah. And that is because I am a creature of the golden age of the media. Yes. Uh, in which the major print newspapers dominated the, the scene. And by the way, they still do to an extent people don't understand. Well, I'll hear you on the briefing. You'll say yeah. something like, for this to show up in a Sunday edition of the New York Times above right. the fold. Right. You know, no, or you'll, or, you're you're <laughs> listening carefully. Yeah. yeah <laughs> or yeah. you'll say something like, oh, yeah, they, yeah. You know, they, they're worried about doomsday, but it was on, you know. C twenty six. That's you right. Know, it's yeah. Like, come on, you're, you're right. communicating some of that. Okay, so you're you're reading newspapers. What but else? Are you the, but by the way, you're pointing out something, and that is that the print edition of these legacy media, okay, the print edition includes information the online edition does not. Yes. Okay. So let me tell you the advantage of print. The most obvious advantage is you can hold it. The second advantage is they can't change it. Yes. And the third advantage is it is embedded with all kinds of information. So. Again, if um, if you look at today, uh, we're talking on a Sunday, you look at today's edition of the New York Times, there are probably eight or nine stories on the front. But there's only one that's at the very top of the page. Uh, and and they, they, if, if, they, if it's a big enough story, like, you know, Australia flooded in a giant monsoon, yeah. you know, that, that might be a full, you know, all of the columns headline. 
But more you have these days is you have a news photograph on the left and you have two or three stories on the right and then stories under the fold. Okay, so that tells you how important they think these are. So mm. those, those two stories in the upper right, they're really important. The story right under that photograph is just really important. Mm. So you can just look at that and you know the editors are saying this is curated. Yes. This made the front page above the fold of the New York Times. Yes, That's yes. just massive. Yes. Okay. And like you you remembered one time I pointed out they were talking about a disaster story. And it's it's way embedded, like page twenty four B, you know. Yeah, it yeah, means yeah. they don't even think they this is that yes. big a story. Yeah. So for instance, just to give you not I don't mean to overly politicize this. But uh, President Biden's speech after the election made mm-hmm. like page nine under the fold. Wow. Now, you know you are not relevant to the conversation if the New York Times puts a president of the United States in a statement of that magnitude, you know, wow. way down deep way, in the paper. Yes. you got to look for it. So that just tells you how that works. And what I want to do on the briefing is help people to understand that. Yes. I start with the the print stuff. Now, I also start by printing stuff, which is to say, so much of the of the what I talk about is found only in digital media right now. Yes. Or, or it's it's found first. You know, breaking story. The New York Times has something online. Washington Post. You know, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and so, I, I do use those digital formats, but you're, you're I, I really reading, need it in print. You're also reading a lot of magazines, correct? I mean, I saw, I, for example, lot, yeah. you know, First Things or The right. New Yorker. or right. Right, if you The were, Economist. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Is there any, you know, you hear people go, oh, man, the mainstream media or, or they've, you know, we can't trust journalism anymore. You'll hear comments like this. Is there anyone that you don't read anymore? That you're like, it's just so far gone. I just, it's been so captured. Well, the answer is yes. And so, for instance, the uh, the big legacy monthlies like The Atlantic and uh, Harper's and things like that, they, they really just pass on the scene in terms of much importance. Yeah. Um, and, and look, some of them have passed from importance because they're just so liberal, no one cares anymore. Yes, yes. You know, they're just nothing more than crybaby sheets of the left. <laughs> um, but there, there, are, there are still some legacy uh, media outlets and, and mastheads that are still yeah. really important. Yeah. And so, for instance, if something's going on in the Middle East, the New York Times may not get it right because they are really operating out of a – certainly a position far more liberal than I yeah. would find acceptable. On the other hand, they've been at international coverage for well over 150 years. And they're going to have 16 people embedded as full-time reporters in the Middle East. A hundred percent. Nobody else can do that. Well, that's what J.D. Vance yeah. brought up with Joe Rogan. I, right. I, if I remember correctly, he said yeah. something like, Joe, you've got you know millions and millions of listeners, but what you can't do right. is send a team of 12 people to right. Ukraine and Russia and right. figure this whole thing out right. like like the legacy media can. Right. right. Okay, so how do you think through the stories? Give me an idea of this. So you're, you're you, I'm guessing any, any, any given day you're going to be 25 to 28 minutes long right. usually. You're usually going to cover two to three stories? Three, it's usually three. Three, okay, three yeah, stories. And sometimes it's really one broken down into three. Yeah. You know, because, uh, for instance, if this, like the Supreme Court hands down the Obergefell decision in 2015 legalizing same-sex marriage. Well, you know, I really can't talk about that for 15 minutes and then say, oh, an interesting art exhibit showed up in Chicago. You know, in <laughs> yeah, other yeah, words, yeah. You, you have to have a sense of, of moral value to yes. these things. Yes, But usually it's it's three separate things, although sometimes like, because of the way worldview works, they're related. And I want to point out how they're related. Yeah, that's it's helpful. Yeah. All right, and then what does it look like? So I think a lot of us are surprised. We wake up, even if I'm, yeah. I'm an early riser as a general right? rule. Uh, and it, I'm it, not. I know you're not, but uh, <laughs> you, you more stay up late. But a lot of times I'll be up at, uh, yeah. so I'll have a 6 a.m. meeting. Not often, yeah. but it happens once a week maybe. So I'll get up at 5. And as I'm putting my coffee on, uh, literally one of the first things I'll do in the morning is, is, is yeah. check the briefing. Very rarely am I up at 5, 5.15, and it is not up. Yeah, yeah. How does this happen? Help us understand. When are you, because you're traveling so much. In fact, there was right. one time recently where you said something like, I'm recording this today from an airport. Yeah. yeah it gets, no, so, it, I mean, you've recorded this It's gotten everywhere. crazy. So let me tell you about election night. Come on. So election night, I and the team, and we're having a good time. I, I mean, in the sense that we got, I've got interns up there with me. Mary's there with me. We've got faculty members and others. So we're, 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 we're just watching the returns come in. Okay. So we were all expecting this. Everybody's telling us this is the closest race in history. Well, it's clear that is not true. Yes. All right. But there's no sign that the election's going to be called anytime soon, simply because of the way different states have the threshold here. And so uh, I wanted to wait until I had the vote for North Carolina and Georgia, because my theory is, 
and was that if uh, if President Trump, for instance, won Virginia, I mean, excuse me, North Carolina and Georgia, he's going to win the election. Okay. You're, now, you're not, I can't you're say not it's worried about Pennsylvania as much. You felt no, like, I'm not okay. saying I'm not worried about it, but let's put it this way. Kamala Harris has a very difficult time putting together a winning map if she loses Georgia and North Carolina. I agree. All right. But the same thing's true with Donald Trump. If he loses either one of them, it's, it's very difficult. Well, we now know, of course, he carried all seven swing states. Yes. All right. We did not know that at 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. So at 2.30 in the morning, nonetheless, I think I know enough to call that uh, Donald Trump has won those two swing states. And it's going to be very difficult uh, for Kamala Harris to win the election. So I recorded the entire briefing. I get home. It's near 4 o'clock. No. I walk in, and my sweet wife says, you know Fox has called the election for Trump. And so I immediately, oh. I just got home. I just got out of the studio. I just got home. I turn on, and Trump's getting ready to give a victory speech. So I just texted my team and said, look, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't even go back until... Trump gives us. You got to hear this speech now. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was up until about six, somewhere like that. Wow. You know? and, and and the briefing was later that morning. I don't think it was up till about five twenty. Okay, <laughs> a little bit later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's two things that are seem to be. I do it before I go to bed at night. I can I cannot wake up and do it. I get it. So, but, but and it has to be to ready usually at three o'clock a.m. So, in other words, every every day, five days a week, the challenge is to have it done by three o'clock a.m. Yeah, and, and most times you're probably recording it after midnight. You know, it all depends on where I am and when it is. Okay. Yeah, so especially when I'm on the West Coast, it's after midnight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's at least yeah. three unique things about you, I think, as I think about uh -huh. you for the, with the briefing. Number one, the giant intellect you have and the different experiences. Number two, your, your voracious reading habits. And then number three, your interesting sleep schedule. As I as I put, yeah. so so basically, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm imagining you. You've got this intellect that you've you've had for a long time. In fact, I remember you listening. You you don't know how much I've listened to you talk over the years. You told stories at one point. I told my kids this. Yeah. I said you're going to meet Dr. Mueller. So when Dr. Mueller was a kid, uh -huh. he used to hide encyclopedias under the car seat. Under the car seat. Yeah. So that. And my kids go, what's an encyclopedia? Oh, I and know. So, so I had to explain. I'm like, guys, it's like a dictionary. Well, that's bad parenting. You know, huh? Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so I explained this. I said, yeah, yeah, he used to read these. Things. Anyway, so you got this intellect. And then you're such a fast reader. How do you, uh, I mean, has that always been just like, tell I us. Have, I, I have, a, I've always been a voracious reader. And look, I, I'm going to credit and blame my parents for this. Okay. And my grandmother, my dad's mom, who was an elementary school teacher. So she just made sure I was surrounded by books. And boy, I took to them like you, crazy. Yes. And uh, as soon as I could learn to read, I just want to read all the time. And so I used to get in trouble because I would have a lot of trouble going to sleep. And so I would read. And, you know, it was paying a little bit of a test of wills. And you know what? I had a good Christian father. His will's going to win. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, I got in trouble and got punished more times than one. For reading late at night. For or turning the light back on and oh, reading. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes I was trying to hide it. It didn't work. <laughs> And uh, my dad, though, was just, he had, he had wonderful instincts on this. And so he, we went out and got a hamburger one day, and I'm just first born son. And he said, Son, you got to obey me. You got to obey your mom. You got to do what we say. Yeah. Uh, I'm watching you, and I, I think you're mature enough. I'm going to trust you with something. Hmm. And that is, you can stay up an extra hour reading, but you can't get out of bed, and all you can do is read. Yeah. And, uh, I'll get emotional about this because my dad would come in many nights. You know, I, I didn't have to go to to bed, I mean, to sleep at lights out at 8. I could stay at lights out at 9, Yeah, you know, as long as I read. And it was just so sweet because I would only figure out later that my dad's coming in and taking the book and putting it on the table because I'd fallen asleep oh. reading. And he turns out the light. So sweet. Praise for me. Yeah, it's just very sweet. Yes. And I think that that's that's a Christian dad being a dad. Right yeah, there. I love it. Laying down the law and then saying, you know, I think there's something that that is and, real about you. And, and I yes. wanna I want to encourage the right things. That's right. I you want know? you to be a reader. I see right, an intellect. I right. see it. That's a powerful story. Yeah. Well, I, and I don't know if this is an urban legend or not, but uh -huh. I heard I heard Mark Dever say one time that uh you you two went into a bookstore. Uh -huh. And he lost you for about 30 minutes or something, uh -huh. and he found you, and uh -huh. you were reading a book. And he said, how far are you? And you said something like, 
on page 120 or yeah. something. So I'm an you, extremely so you, fast reader. You, yeah. That, yeah. So, but does that work? Because I've seen some of the stuff you're doing for the briefing. You, you had some documents with you. Yeah. You, you're reading very fast while you're marking. Right. Okay. Right. Now tell us finally about like, so you record this. It right. takes you, 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 there's a little bit of editing, but in general, you're recording. Once I, I, you know I'm what you want to say. I'm a self-editing speaker, so it, there's not that much editing. So it's probably, it takes me about 45 minutes for a 25-minute yeah. podcast. Yeah. Well, I want to end with one last thing, and we'll let you go. And Partly, I, I want people to talk to me about who are in the studio. You know, did I accomplish what I wanted to accomplish? Yeah, that's it's, good. It's a very good thing that you have honest people listening who can say, "Yeah, I think you accomplished what you set out to accomplish," or not. Yeah. Well, I want to end on just a personal yeah. note for us, uh, our church. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, at the time of this recording, mm -hmm. you have been kind enough to do an ask anything. Uh, uh -huh. As well as to preach two services, you got one more uh -huh. tonight. Thank you, in, in a bit of a busy schedule, uh, and we've got a full schedule for you. Thank you for coming and doing this podcast. I would be interested. You know, we are an eight-year-old church. I told uh -huh. you the story of our church. We've grown very quickly, numerically, mm -hmm. spiritually, organizationally. Honestly, more has happened in eight years than I thought was going to happen in five yeah. or six decades. Yeah. And I guess my question, just as as an older man in the faith, yeah. as as a guy who's seen a lot, who's traveled, literally traveled the world. Yeah. What advice do you have for our church? Oh, Kyle, it's a kind question. I'm not sure I'm very good with advice. I'm pretty good with direction. What when, direction? When I, when, no, when, no when, <laughs> I, when I know something's right or wrong, yeah. I, I feel very confident to say, that's right, that's wrong. Uh, let me tell you what's right that I just perceive in being with you. I mean, it's being with you yeah. and being with your people. Um. There's a wonderful kindness. There's a happiness in Christ, a joy in Christ. Thank you. There's a real clear sense of conviction. Yeah. Uh, and and the questions last night they were they were they were predicated on knowledge. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of good, solid, evangelical Christian conviction that came yes, out. Yes. Yes. So you don't find that everywhere. And so where I find it, I just thank God for it. Yeah. And I think right here in Winston Salem, North Carolina, it's just wonderful to see what the Lord's building in His church. You know, I, I would say that I wish, so let me just speak very personally, I wish I had been much better at saying thank you than I was when I was younger. Wow. And uh, I just don't think I recognize the stewardship of that. I was incredibly thankful to people. I don't think I said it enough. Mm, that's and now word. some of them are dead. Yeah. Well, and you know, I just wish I could hmm. go back and talk to them and tell them, how much I appreciate yeah. what they did for me. Yeah. Well, our That's mutual a, our mutual friend yeah. James Merritt, when I yeah. when I first met him, uh -huh. I was impressed with his youthfulness at seventy two. Still, right. just his energy. Right. And I said to him, I mm -hmm. said, "You're you're an older man walking in the faith." And I said, "Now wait just a minute. Number one, <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Hold on, Kyle. Yeah, yeah one, right. ho, ho, hold on. I got yeah, well, three points to make. Number one, <laughs> Georgia Bulldog. Yeah, yeah. B. Um, that's right. No, let's go ahead. But uh, anyway, talking to James Merritt, I said to him, mm -hmm. how, "How could I be like you in my seventies? Uh -huh. In the first thing, similar to what you're saying, he said, Kyle." Be nice on your way up. You'll meet the same people on your way down. Well, and I thought, yeah. what a word. Yeah, yeah. And and I think part of that kindness is saying thank you. And so, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I just I I want people to have war. I, uh, look, I mean, we deal with very tough stuff. Any minister does. Any pastor I get does. It. Any theologian does. Any Christian ethicist. Any cultural commentator. Every any worldview analyst. We got to deal with tough stuff. I pray I don't become a tough person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm i afraid I err sometimes the other way now. In talking with you a couple of times, I've teared up, but I just, I, you know. You're a grandfather now. We didn't even get to talk about that. By the yeah. way, I do have to ask this. What is your grandfather name? Papa. Papa, okay. Yeah, and it is phenomenal. It's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, everything they kid about saying, you know, if I'd known grandparents, grandparenting was so great, I would have skipped right to it, skipped the parenting part. <laughs> but, you know, that's not God's plan. And I'm very thankful for every moment that we had with children, our children in the home. Amen. But watching our daughter as a mother is just, mm. oh, my goodness. It's I just love it. phenomenal. Yeah. Well, I probably will never forget. Yeah. Uh, last night, you you're about to leave, and uh -huh. uh, you and I started talking about how Ask Anything went. And you said, where else uh -huh. can a 12-year-old boy right. come up to a mic with his mom or his yeah. family yeah. and ask a question? I mean, yeah. that, you know, yeah. it's just it's the local church on yeah. full display. So I told you, you last night. Yes. That uh, my favorite kind of way to end the night was a 10-year-old boy hmm. who didn't get to ask a question. Mm -hmm. And he is sitting actually up on your platform with his dad standing beside him. And he clearly has a question. And he wants to know if I think prehistoric sharks might still be alive in the ocean. <laughs> 
And he talked about Megalodon. And then I said, yes, I think they may be. There's a there's good reason why. We just don't know what's in the depths, yeah. you know, and, and we know we don't know a lot. But there are some creatures already identified, especially in the deep Arctic waters, that are actually kind of like prehistoric creatures. And so I just simply said, I hope so. And this little 10-year-old boy looks at me and says, you think in the Mariana Trench? <laughs> You're thinking, how does he know about the Mariana Trench? But it is the perfect 10-year-old boy moment. I love it. You know, and I just want this kid to know, man, charge after it, buddy. Let's go. And I want to tell you, all the things that interest this is what's the difference between girls becoming women and boys becoming men. Hmm. Girls have to put away childish things. Men really don't. Yeah. I just bought three Megalodon teeth. <laughs> In the last few weeks, Go I took on. out my phone and showed this boy. I said, "No, I believe in Megalodon. I got three of his teeth. Come on, and, you know, two of them are about the bet size that, of my hand." I was going to say, "I bet that." Oh, he day. just, he just, eyes just bugged out. You know, and it's one of these things. You go, okay, this is the thing. I grow up. One difference is I can buy these things, yep. and I can have them in here because the stuff that fascinated me, everything that fascinated me as a boy, still fascinates me as a man. I love it. Well, Carl Jung, uh-huh. you know, he he said that when you become a man, you have to give up boyish things. But then he says. Part of the end of the journey of manhood yeah. is rediscovering the things you loved as a boy, as a man. Yeah, I mean, some of it's been pretty constant with me, and I, obviously, I, I'm teasing about in the New no, Testament, I, no, I get the Pauline it. admonition. Yeah. We do have to put away childish things. I know what you mean. Immaturity. Yes. But there are fascinating interests that we never have to give up on. I love it. And and I think there's a curiosity in the heart of a child that is godly. Yes. And you know, seizes upon something. Yes. And you know, so which is healthier? A kid seizes upon something, or he never seizes on anything. It's much healthier when he seizes upon something. And then you don't want to take that away. You just want to add the next and add the next. You know, I, I have moms tell me, I got a you know, 12-year-old son, 13-year-old son. He's fascinated with this. How can I interest him in other things? I said, let him stay up late reading the book about what you want him to read about. See how that goes. Yeah. But I also say, look, you know, you cannot make a 10-year-old child instantly interested in the nature of legislative politics. I agree. Yeah. He doesn't see anything eat each other. I'm not saying they don't eat each other. But he doesn't <laughs> see it. He doesn't see it. And so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think one of the fun things about Christian truth is that it's true. All truth is God's truth. Yes, yes. And, I mean, we can we can find a way to praise God that a 10-year-old boy is asking about prehistoric sharks in the Mariana Trench. Amen. Well, maybe that's a good place for us to end. But as we do yeah. end— if our listeners wanted to find out more yeah. about Dr. Moeller, where, where do we find your 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 writings, your teaching? Where, where should we visit? Okay, so my radio program is called the Albert Moeller Program. Okay. How is that for humility? <laughs> and uh, I didn't name it. The network did. And the network owned it. Yeah. And uh, they did so because they said, this is a personal medium. Yeah. So if people don't know anything, if they know your name, they'll yeah. be able to find the program. That's right. And so everything's at albertmoeller.com. Great. That's it. And from there, yeah. they can follow you on Twitter or social media, yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as yeah. check you out yeah. at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. SBTS.edu and voicecollege.com. Love it. As you end every yeah. briefing episode, we end with Boyce yeah. College and Southern Seminary. Thank you so much for your time. And if you are listening or watching online, I would encourage you to go to albertmoeller.com and to begin to be, if you're not already, a daily listener to the briefing. See you next Thank time you. on Open Bible, Open Life. 